Good morning, Grace Place Church family. So glad you're able to join us today. We have a very important message that I want to share with you this morning. A few weeks ago, coming towards the end of the series on Rooted, uh, I felt God had laid on my heart to preach a series of messages that aren't necessarily tied to a series. They're important what we call one-off messages and teachings. Uh, one of them was last week on community. If you didn't get a chance to hear that, I encourage you to go back and listen to it. And then this week's message. And uh, there were times last year that I felt I wanted to share with you what I'm going to share with you today. But because of circumstances that were taking place in our church or in the world around us, I felt it was too pointed to try to deal with those issues in those moments. But I felt the release today to uh, bring the message that I'm going to share with you. And uh, we are enough removed from various kinds of circumstances that would tie to this. that I think we can look at the importance of this for our life uh, right now and, and allow God to teach us from his word. I've titled the message today, When People You Walk With Walk Away. What happens when people that you've walked with closely walk away from you? We're going to take as our text uh, out of John chapter 6. If you want to find that in your Bibles, John chapter 6, beginning at verse 66, and then we'll read verse 67. Now, there's a whole context of this passage, which we'll talk about over the course of this message. But the text will get us to uh, what we are looking at today and uh, deal with the issue of what happens when people that you love and care for walk away from your life. All right, so John chapter 6, beginning at verse 66, reads, From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? Father, we ask that you would just guide and direct these next few moments that we're together that we would be inspired by the Holy Spirit, taught by you, the principles and the truths that come out of this passage that are so vital to our understanding uh, that we might not, Lord, uh, get in a place of being bitter or upset uh, or deeply wounded and hurt in ways that would not allow us to move forward and advance the kingdom of God, that you would be glorified in all the relationships around us, God, and that we would do our very best to be the very best that you've called us to be in every relationship you've given us and placed around our lives. That we might live out Christianity uh, rather than just be, live out a religious kind of an experience. God, teach us through your word today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. When people that we have walked with walk away, it really does hurt. Uh, you may spend long hours wondering, you know, what you may have done or what you could have done differently to keep that relationship intact. Now, it's happened to me and uh, Michelle, you know, many times over our life and in our ministry that people that we loved and cared for, and in many instances, we opened our personal lives up to and had a deep, close personal relationship with, even inviting them as much into family, have walked away. Often it's unclear uh, why they just walk away. It, it, I can tell you from experience that it never gets easier and uh, that it is a kind of constant, that there will be people who will come into our lives for seasons and then they uh, exit our lives. And it's never easy to say goodbye to people. It's never easy when people walk away, but especially uh, when they walk away and uh, they intend to have no further relationship. They've kind of disconnect the cords. And uh, you will grieve that, and it's, and it's okay to grieve that loss. It's, it's easy, um, you know, to uh, make excuses. But, you know, the bottom line is there's, there's really a lot of pain involved when people that you love and care for walk away. It's, and, there, and one of the reasons is it's not easy to make friends in the first place. And you open your life up and you invest and you build trust. And so when someone that you really care about walks away, uh, it, it, can, it can hurt you deeply. As we take a look at this morning, what, what should we do when people that we went to church with, 
that we served in leadership with, people that we worshiped with, uh, walk away. And when, when the path that uh, you and I are following with Jesus narrows and uh, it, it gets difficult, someone that you love or you care about decides they don't want to walk further with you, it can be a deep, deep pain. When you grow close to God and, and you answer the call of God in your life, we want everyone to go with us. We're excited about the, the calling of God in our lives, about fulfilling that calling, answering uh, yes to Him, about glorifying His name, about worshiping Him. And, we, and to discover that there are those around us that we love and care about that aren't excited about it and do not want to go on that part of the journey with us, that can be deeply painful and hurtful. When people we know and we've loved uh, walk away, it, it really does hurt. And it's like uh, it, it, we've ex all experienced that rejection uh, and, and it's never, it never gets any easier. There's, there's a lot of books and uh, blog posts that are available out there for uh, talking about unhealthy relationships and how that we can deal with unhealthy relationships. Now we can break away from unhealthy relationships. There's tons of insights and tips on how to walk away from abusive and dangerous relationships. But what about the story that we're talking about today, where people who walked with Jesus walked away? And what about stories in our life when it wasn't uh, abusive, uh, you know, hurtful, harmful relationships? It was just people that we loved and cared about, people we may have shared the same church with, people that we may have shared uh, ministry opportunities with, suddenly make a decision to walk away. What's that about? The story in the Bible says, begins that we're reading, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. This is Jesus. He was sinless. He was compassionate, he was trustworthy, he's a miracle worker, a friend of sinners, a teacher, a prophet. He was fully man, wonderfully fully God. And yet many of his disciples, it says in this passage, after this teaching, walked away. If it happened to Jesus, I think you and I can understand that it likely will happen to us in our lifetime too. So what's the problem? Why did they leave Jesus? Why did these disciples walk away? It's kind of interesting and maybe a little humorous when we think about it from this perspective. Jesus had just finished a discourse about bread. Have you ever had people walk away from a relationship with you because you talked about bread? Jesus did. Let's see what was said here a little earlier in the passage. John chapter 6, verses 26 and 27. Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. We get the picture here now that many in that gathering were not necessarily there for Jesus. They, uh, they were okay with seeing him. He was a contemporary speaker in their day, and they wanted to see if he would do some kind of miracles. They wanted to kind of watch the show, but they had also heard that Jesus did miracles. And if you were hungry, he fed the, uh, those who were hungry. He, he, the miracle where he broke the loaves of bread and, and, and uh, the fish and was able to feed the entire group of people. And so as we look at, at stories like that and miracles that took place, recognize that there are people that come and hang out uh, with Jesus to, you know, just to see what's going to happen, just to, to experience the show. We call them sometimes fans who are not necessarily yet committed disciples who are following Jesus, but they are that peripheral group of people who are kind of just checking it out. So Jesus is talking about here in this early passage about bread. The kind of bread that feeds your body 
you know, but then it perishes. And he's talking about a second kind of bread, the kind of bread that gives you life spiritually and eternally. He's talking about himself. As he gives his discourse, he bears down on this pivotal point. As we read a little further, he says, Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat of the bread of the Son of Man and drink of his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats of his flesh and drinks of his blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last days, for my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. I'll read on. It's not on your PowerPoint, but I'll read on a little further in the passage. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as your fathers ate manna and are dead, he who eats his, his, this bread will live forever. Jesus is, is bringing into focus a memory in Jewish history of when they were, were delivered out of Egyptian bondage and traveling in the desert, and God marvelously fed them a bread called manna. But that bread perishes. And Jesus says, I am going to feed you a bread, my word, which will endure and in you and stay in you, and you will live forever. Jesus' point was not that it is uh, not enough to listen to his teachings. And, and to, to, it's not just enough for, for people just to listen to his teachings and to be impressed by his miracles. But we have to accept the physical death and resurrection in order to be forgiven of our sins. And here's the point. Those who struggled with Jesus' words, those who walked away in that time, were those who did not believe him. Ultimately, they did not believe him or believe in him. The problem, uh, their problem was, was not that they needed, you know, more scholarly books, uh, better scholarship and, and scholarship works. It wasn't that they needed better apologetics or more scientific evidence. Today, sometimes I think we, we believe that if people you know, would just read the right book that refutes evolution, or if they would, um, you know, hear the right person who endorses creation, uh, uh, or read a book that defends the accuracy of the Bible, or uh, listen to a CD, or watch a DVD that presents uh, the latest in archaeological discoveries that prove the Christian faith. If we could just get them there, then somehow they would be uh, believers and they would be followers. But you might remember a story in Luke chapter 16 where Jesus talks about uh, two men, a rich man and a poor man. Both of them die, and after their death, uh, the rich man uh, is in hell, and, and the, uh, the poor man winds up in, in what's called Abraham's bosom, comforted by God. The rich man cries out in, in agony, and he says, you know, could, could you send someone to tell my brothers who are still alive on the earth not to come where I am, to warn them not to live for themselves, to, to invite them to believe in the Messiah, or in the Savior, and to, to not come here where I am. And the answer comes back in Luke chapter 16, verse 31, after he requests, uh, the rich man's requesting that they bring some ghost or someone from the dead to frighten his brothers, maybe something along the line of what you and I are familiar with, with uh, the Christmas story Scrooge, where the ghost of Christmas past, the ghost of Christmas present, and the ghost of Christmas future. And perhaps uh, along that line was what this rich man was thinking. Send in someone from the dead that they would recognize that would frighten them from coming to the place where I am. But here's the answer. And he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. He's pointing out to them that the unbelief has to be overcome in this life that we have to, by faith, overcome our doubts and our unbelief. And it happens 
uh, not only by knowing and reading God's Word, but by entering into a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ, inviting Him in to be Lord and to be leader of our life. The act of faith is the act of trusting God's Word in the midst of doubts. God wrote the Scriptures, and the words of the Scriptures pierce the heart and the very soul. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. I was talking about this a few weeks ago at church, how just hearing the Word of God read can pierce our souls and touch our hearts. There's power in this book. And it's not just the words that are here, but it is the Holy Spirit who enforces the words that are here and works them in our hearts and lives as we hear them read and as we read them for ourselves. They convict and they lead one to Jesus. And Jesus said that his words were spiritual words. And one needs uh, the Holy Spirit to help him understand those words. And that God uh, said, uh, Jesus said to his disciples, I'm, the Holy Spirit is coming. That's why I'm ascending. I'm inviting him to come and to be that one who teaches you. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 through 14, talk about the Holy Spirit as teacher uh, in our lives and the work that is, is done there. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak. Not the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Here's a very, very important point. And if you don't hear anything else about when friends walk away that you've walked with, understand it from this perspective. When will, your personal will, wars against surrender, surrendering to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, doubt bells you out. Doubt will bell will out. One of the primary reasons that people uh, are embracing doubt about the Christian walk and view is it is a bailout in many respects for their will, which is warring against surrendering to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Not everyone who tells you they don't really believe the Bible or believe about God is telling you the truth. Many of them do, but they are comforted by their doubt and those and others around them who doubt because it is a bailout for their will, recognizing that if they continue to investigate and if they continue to pursue and seek God, they're going to be called to surrender to his lordship and they no longer will have the ability to be the Lord of their own lives and lead, go down the path they wanna go down. They're going to be surrendered to the Lordship and leadership of God in their life through Jesus Christ. If all you have in life is religious traditions of man and you tear those things down, when you get to the foundation, you're left with unbelief. But if Jesus is Lord of your life and you strip away the religious tradition of men, then you're going to be left with Jesus. I like to say it this way, doubt can't live in the house that Jesus built. One of the, the things we've been talking about uh, in previous weeks about the deconstruction movement is if you're deconstructing and the foundation was never built where Jesus was Lord, when you get to the foundation, you have unbelief. If you have Jesus as the foundation and you start stripping away the dogma and the religiosity and the things that men have said that aren't necessarily the things God have said, when you get down to the foundation, you're going to find Jesus. He's going to be there for you to comfort you and to give you a direction. Just like Jesus, some people who walk with you um, and some people who walked with Jesus walked away. And just like that, for you and I, some people who walk with us are going to walk away. You can't stop people from leaving, 
but we can open our hearts and allow Jesus to heal our hearts and so that we won't become bitter, angry, upset, uh, fearful about building new relationships. It's so important that God heal us when we've been rejected and when people walk away from us because the next person that God wants to send into our life is at our door right now. And God wants us to build a relationship, on, continue to have open friendships and build new relationships all the time. Now, I want to be clear about what we're saying in this message. I want you to clearly understand what we're talking about and what I'm saying here. If you mistreat people who walk w with you in your life, if, you, if, there, if, if there is addiction, sinful behavior, gossip, cruelty, controlling behaviors that's been happening with you, then people did not walk away from you. You drove them away. And it's different from what I'm talking about today. The crux of this message is when you are walking with God closely and in relationship with Him, and people that you love and care about who maybe also were walking with God suddenly decide to walk away from you, then that is painful. And that's what happened to Jesus. And that's kind of what we're talking about. We're not talking about being hurtful and abusive. Now listen, that said, there are no perfect people. There's only a perfect Savior. So in community, as we talked about last week, we are forgiving to one another and loving one another, and we give each other grace. We don't always act as we should and, and do as we should, but in a grace-filled, loving environment, we can all uh, come together and have long-term relationship. You don't have to walk away because of one or two or three incidents that may have happened to you in church family or with a friendship that really uh, where you both love God and care about Him. You can heal those things over and continue to have great, growing, deep relationship. When people that you know and that you love, though, walk away, what do you do? Here's what Jesus did, and it's interesting. It says in this passage that many of the disciples walked away, what did Jesus do? It says, Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? Do you also want to go away? Here's what we can take away from what happens when people walk away from our lives. Here's what Jesus did. Jesus focused on the ones who stayed. It's so important that we don't get so distracted by people that we love and care about that may have walked away that we miss the ones who stayed. The ones who stayed there to love uh, and, and to be embraced, to be taught, to be encouraged, to feed into our lives as well as us feeding into their lives. And Jesus recognized that the pursuit of people who were bent on leaving in rebellion was a fruitless pursuit. That the people who were still there were the ones that he needed to focus his attention on. <laughs> there has been a, a lot of discussion over uh, the last year or so uh, in church circles uh, with the rise of a social justice gospel that's kind of uh, being pushed in to kind of replace the gospel um, of the Bible. And uh, there's been a lot of, of, of uh, talk in that circle about a passage out of Luke chapter 15, verse 4. I want to read it to you. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 uh, in the open country and go after the lost one until he finds it? The proper context for this particular passage is important for us. And the proper context is that all the sheep belonged to the shepherd. All 100%. John chapter uh, 10, verse 26, 27, emphasizes that point for us to understand. It says, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. In other words, the proper way to apply this passage out of uh, Luke chapter 15 uh, in our lives is uh, that we, we understand that those who believe and have made Jesus Lord of their life, 
but some circumstances in their lives have separated them from family. These are the people who are, are uh, these are not people who are knowingly and willingly uh, in rebellion and leave the Christian community. These are people who belong to the Great Shepherd and will gladly come home when shown the way. They are part of the sheep, the ones who hear God's voice, the ones who are surrendered to him. They are not those who are bent on uh, leaving and finding their own way and uh, tearing things down and being destructive in terms of uh, the relationships uh, you have and around you, right? So uh, the proper context for going out after the one who left the 99 is that one still belongs to God. That one uh, is, uh, is just going through difficulties and challenges and crises, and they just need to be surrounded by the community again and shown the way home. So proper context is important when we're looking at passages. It never uh, speaks in this passage about the pursuit of those who, who are bent on just tearing out and leaving on their own. It is those who, uh, through circumstances of life, have kind of wandered into harmful situations and they still have Jesus as Lord and leader of their lives. They need to be brought back and the great shepherd does that. He loves them and so does his community. His community is always there to embrace him. The beautiful story uh, about the prodigal son, uh, he was welcomed home by the father and they threw a great banquet and celebration in honor of him. Uh, because that he was coming home. He had strayed away and he's coming back. Jesus said that many had, in this passage, many had walked away. He says to his disciples, will you walk away also? Simon Peter answers for the group, uh, for himself primarily, but as a spokesman in the group. And he says, Simon Peter answered to him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. It's beautiful uh, when you read through this passage and understand that you are anchored so strongly when you have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. When you have really surrendered your life to him, that the doubts that come, and they do come for all of us, even those who've been Christians for many years, they have no chance of, stand, of blowing you off of the foundation. They, we can go ahead and strip away um, the, the uh, religiosity, man's traditions, but we always wind up with that solid, firm foundation of Jesus Christ in our life. When people walk away that we love and we care about, it's okay to grieve. It's okay to pray for them. It's all right even to reach out and, and invite them back. It's, but it's important that we heal in our lives because there are others that God wants to bring in. Today, someone sitting beside you nearby, someone uh, that uh, that is uh, entered your life recently in some way, a coworker or a new neighbor or something, they, they are directly placed in your um, sphere of influence so that God can reach them through you and recognize that it's important not to dwell on the hurt and the pain of someone walking away, but to invite new relationship that God has ready for your life that you can receive from that new relationship because they'll have things to give and bring in your life, but you can also give into their life. My question as we close is, do you belong? Do you belong? And that's the big question for all of us in this series uh, or this message. Do we belong to the Savior? Do we belong to Him? Have we fully surrendered our lives or heart to Him? This is our opportunity to make sure that's the situation today. In this passage, it's kind of frightening to think that there were people who labeled themselves as disciples and followers of Jesus and were in the group and uh, regularly attending the teachings and things of Jesus, that when he taught something that was a little harder for them to get their minds around, when he taught about being fully surrendered and committed in, in their relationship, that they decided to walk away. And that happens. And it's, it's scary 
to, because we could think that that also could be us if we don't stay anchored in him, if we don't stay firmly uh, and solid in the foundation that he's created for us. And if we get uh, hurt to, if we allow bitterness to creep in, if we allow hurt and pain to begin to rule in our lives, then we too could be those who walk away. But it's instructive in the sense of what Simon Peter says and, and uh, encouraging. Lord, there's nowhere else for us to go. You're the one who has the very words of life that bring life to us. And that's what Jesus said in this teaching about bread. There's bread that perishes. You eat it, it sustains you for that moment and that day. It goes away, you need it again the next day. But there's bread that you can eat that will lead you eternally in your walk and, and, and uh, in all of your life and into eternity will suffice and take care of your spirit. That's what we need and that's what we want today. I wanna to pray a prayer with you of surrender. This is your moment, let's invite God and let's, in, let's surrender our whole heart to Him. But I also wanna pray for you today, uh, for those who've walked away from your life, maybe people that you did go to church with, that you worshiped with, people that um, you had close friendships with and relationships with, and you felt like that they, were, they loved God and they cared about God, and you guys were just gonna go walking together in relationship uh, all the way to the end of life. And somewhere along the line, they left, and it's hurt, and it's, it's wounded you. And you, you, you have not yet dealt with that. And I want to ask you to deal with that today with God. Allow Him to bring some healing. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we all have been wounded this way. We've all been rejected at times. And I'm, I'm asking God that you would help us to heal over that. Because it's so important that we understand that you have other relationships you want to bring into our life but our, our unwillingness to heal and to allow you to process these things in our life has prevented these relationships from being embraced in our lives now. Heal us, God, from all wounds and hurts and pains, recognizing that, uh, Lord, there were people that walked away from you and uh, you lived a, a much purer, holy life than we can ever live. We need you, God, to help us. Uh, to process this, to heal it, and to be able to move forward. And I'm asking God that you would, would just uh, help us to make a full surrender, that we might know we belong to you today. Lord, this is our place where we say, forgive us of our sins, cleanse us of all unrighteousness. If we have said things that are hurtful and, and damaging, that you would help us to heal those over, Lord, to forgive, to release, and to ask for forgiveness where we need to do that. And we ask, God, that you would make us your children, God. Shape us in your image. Fashion us after what you have intended and what you want. And give us, Lord, um, your direction day by day and moment by moment. We surrender ourselves to your lordship over our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, we love you guys. Thank you for joining us this Sunday. God bless you. Have an awesome, awesome day.